let us move on to the next speaker. Uh, Shri Nikunj Trivedi Ji, Creating Caste Consciousness, the Colonial Reengineering of Indian Society. Welcome, Nikunj. Namaskar. Yes, Namaskar. Thank you very much uh, for having me today. So I have the, I, I obviously may overlap with some of the things that have been already said. So my apologies for that. But um, what I want to do is just share my screen and walk people through some of the observations that I've had about the colonial social reengineering project that has resulted in what we call CAST today. Uh, and I'll be using CAST in quotations because as some of the speakers may have said earlier, this word is not native to our language, and uh, it's a very much of a colonial construct. So uh, bear with me as I share my screen. Okay, seems it's loaded. So first thing, uh, just kind of, I think people may have already touched upon this. So I always like to start with this, the origins of caste. Uh, as we know, caste is an Iberian term, uh, which comes from the, the word casta. Uh, this essentially originally referred to something like a breed or race uh, that was based on a system that codified people based on race, color, and birth in medieval Europe. When you looked at Portuguese or Spaniards, etc., they were using this word very, very uh, closely associated with someone who was born in a certain way or to keep a pure breed of their particular Iberian, um, you know, whether you're Spanish or Portuguese birth uh, descent. This concept was then essentially uh, taken from there uh, to various parts of the world. And we'll come to the Indias in, in a second, but one of the places where it was really used was Spanish Americas. And you may see this uh, when, when they were trying to classify indigenous people, uh, whether they're Native Americans or uh, blacks that were basically brought in as slaves as essentially racially inferior, while the white Spaniards were considered racially and uh, by blood, um, you know, uh, ra racially pure and, and superior. Uh, another uh, aspect of this was actually the Jewish community, which uh, many people may or may not know, but because of the, you know, uh, the accusations against them uh, of the killing of, the, of, of Jesus Christ, etc., they were considered also uh, inferior and uh, they were considered quote, unquote, of bad blood. Uh, when the Portuguese arrived uh, into the Indian, core, uh, Indian subcontinent on the shores of India, they basically re quickly assigned this concept of casta, or as we later know, caste, uh, to the Indian society based on whatever their understanding was uh, from a racial and birth-based superiority perspective. If you look at on the right side, one of the uh, examples that I like to give is the Gong farmers of medieval England. Uh, the Gong farmers were basically kept in, you know, uh, they were kept out of the village or the, the town. They would come in at night to clean human feces and human, human uh, waste and uh, they were not, were not allowed to mix with the rest of the society. So this was the kind of type of thing. So similarly, many others, skinners, grave diggers, et cetera, used to face a lot of uh, sort of discrimination and exclusion from general society. Here's a great, quick example of the Spanish America pyramid. Uh, you can see the ones that are on peninsula are the ones that are born in Iberian Peninsula were considered the, the topmost or most superior while the, the Africans and the Native Americans uh, were considered all the way to the bottom of this. And bet in between that, you had a combination of people who were you know, born in America, but they were 100% uh, descent, a combination of European and Native American or European African descent and things like that. And on the right side, this is a very famous painting that comes up in many places, uh, especially uh, I found this in one of the, uh, the um, online websites of a Mexican museum, where they actually showed the different types of combinations of these uh, castes, basically. Uh, here's a, is, is a very interesting quote from the portal called Black Past. Uh, the Black Past portal actually talks about Sistema de Casta, which is the words that are that translate into uh, the caste system. At its most extreme, there were about 40 classifications, with Espanol being the most desirable and Negro being the least desirable for social political purposes. Race, color, physical features, occupation, and wealth in this society mattered as Spanish officials attempted to control every aspect of a person's life, whether it's employment or regulating dress codes and friendship. Now, this is very interesting because we'll see this type of pattern, uh, as, as many of may have observed, within the colonial structures that were implemented in uh, the Indian subcontinent. One of the biggest tools that um, you know, was used uh, from, from the British colonial perspective was the idea of the census. Now, the British had a penchant for 
uh, counting and, and codifying and systematizing various things uh, as far as their administration was concerned. So for them to rule India in, in a vast diversity, they had to actually come up with some kind of a tool or some kind of a system to understand Indian culture and map uh, Indian society and map Indian society in what they understood and how their uh, colonial masters back home wanted to understand. So one of the first things they did was introduce the uh, census between the years of roughly 1865 to 1872. And these series of census, the first time caste was introduced uh, widely to classify and force fit. Uh, we talked about the jatis, but also like what they called tribes, religious groups. Uh, there was also a category called semi-Hinduized groups uh, into a, like, different types of methodologies. Uh, they went through whether it's villages or towns, et cetera, counting and classifying. But the methodology itself had a lot of problems. And colonial, uh, those who have uh, you know, studied this phenomenon have observed that very well. If you look at Dirks, he, for example, says that the emperor compositor census was wedded to the most general orientalist categories for the classification of the social order with built-in assumptions about hierarchy and precedent. So this idea was, um, you know, they built a lot of assumptions into the different types of questions and, uh, you know, categories that they were uh, putting in the census. Uh, about who's higher, who's lower, you know, what comes first, what comes later, things like that. Similarly, you can see C.J. Fuller talk about this in his uh, study where he says, coding and classifying were actually a Victorian intellectual preoccupation, whether it's in India or elsewhere. So everyone assumed that, you know, Indian social system had to require accurate counting and classifying of castes and subcastes. Uh, but here he says that it's not a neutral matter because how these things were classified by occupation or by status underpin the rival occupational and racial theories. The prevailing racial theories were actually, uh, you know, were obviously mixed in with this stuff. And we'll see that in a second. Here's an example of some of these, the screenshots uh, that I've taken from the, the census actually of 1871, 1872. You can see the categories used in Bengal and Assam, very interesting, you know, from like superior, intermediate trading, engaged in personal service, occupied in selling fish and vegetables, to the categories that are used in, in the Madras presidency, you can see priests, warriors, shepherds, uh, you have mixed caste, fishermen, palm cultivators, outcasts. So there are like different categories. And, and remember, this is under the same British administration. But the problem was they couldn't categorize due to the complexity. So as a result, the categorization went from 3,000 castes in 1871 to 19,044 castes in 1881. So did the population all of a sudden change? No, in 10 years, your caste you know, went like you know, more than six times, let's say, uh, from an increased perspective. So how did that happen? The answer really is that the census was right with problems of categorization. And this started to have a lot of issues in the, the population and the way they thought about the population and administration in general. Then comes someone like Herbert Port Pisley. In, he was one of the most influential commissioners uh, that actually governed the census from of 1901. The uh, what Risley was trying to do is he was trying to make sure that he he was able to finally get the proper categorization and codification of Indian society. But in order to do that, he deployed various types of race science theories uh, to make sure that his census project is successful. You know, amongst them, many as may have already talked about or are, are familiar with are is the idea of anthropometry and uh, sort of like measuring of head skulls and things like that. Uh, he essentially took the entire Indian population and force fitted thousands of jatis and to, into this idea of varna, and then essentially came up with this idea of seven castes, okay? What are the seven castes? So if you look at his, uh, his study, he talks about these seven castes, tribal castes, functional castes, sectarian castes, castes formed by crossing, national castes, castes formed by migration, cast formed by changes of customs, so on and so forth. But what's really interesting is these in all these caste formations uh, assumed certain things about Indian culture, about the you know the the, the religion that was in called Hinduism. Uh, of course, they also talked about uh, Muslims and others, but they also assumed the uh, the racist Aryan invasion theory was de facto and a fact of life. Uh, so by using the racist Aryan invasion theory, they created this idea that somehow you know, the, the white superior man came from outside and uh, intermingled with the black in native population. And somehow uh, some of these intermixing, there was degrading of castes and that's why you have so many different castes and so on and so forth. 
So that was kind of his racist colonial view uh, that he started to put into the administration. But what are the observations? One of the things that I realized that while these guys were doing this, the, the British administrators and writers themselves observed that there was really no widespread discrimination. So here are some examples. So H.D. Colebrook, for example, said that daily observation shows even the Brahmin exercising the menial profession of a Shudra. Uh, you know, every single different types of profession with few exceptions is open to every description of persons and the discouragement arising from religious prejudice is not greater than what exists in Great Britain from the effects of municipal and corporation laws. He also observed that Brahmins, again, are, are employed the most servile of offices and Shudras often elevated to situations of respectability and, and, and importance. Another administrator, Mr. Hamilton in 1815, also observed something similar. Commerce and agriculture are universally permitted to all classes and under the general designation of servants to the other three tribes, the Shudras seem to be allowed to prosecute any manufacturer. In this tribe are included not only the true Shudras, but also other castes. Daily observation shows even Brahmin exercise in the menial profession of a Shudra. Now, what's interesting here is that he also uses the word tribes. So you can see the interchangeable uh, usage of castes and tribes and things like that, because they themselves were not very sure whether you should call these castes, we should call them tribes, we should call them something else, et cetera, et cetera. General Colin um, also actually had a, a very big survey around 1801, and he, he went around all of India and mapped the society and the culture at that time. But in his entire massive survey, you do not see any widespread caste as the dominant system of differentiation, identity, hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera. If this uh, sort of problem existed previously in a systematized way, a survey like his would have mapped this at least uh, in a, a large part of the Indian subcontinent. Here's another observation. Here's a medical school in 1839, an elite medical school in Calcutta. This table actually shows that the Brahmins actually, the so-called Brahmin caste, quote unquote, uh, is only five people out of 50, while you have others like Ayasta or Baidya or like bankers, et cetera, are higher in number. So the Brahmins, in this particular medical college, for example, were a minority. Another example we see is an 1822 report by Mr. A.D. Campbell, uh, who was the collector of the, in the, the Madras presidency, observed interesting uh, statistics that there were in that entire thing, there were 1,187 Brahmin pupils. But look at this, there's 3,024 Sudar, as they call, or Shudra pupils. So the Shudra pupils, for example, in that school system, um, outnumbered Brahmins by almost three times. We also see what the end result was. So from 1871 to 1921, the British, British actually achieved their dream of visualizing the whole society as a map of various caste and tribes, how the way they wanted to define and administer. And of course, by 1935, we know that the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes list was drawn up, but they were the ones who created that, which, which will be considered depressed and oppressed and which are not considered that. So by default, if you are in a scheduled caste or scheduled tribal list, you are considered the depressed and oppressed classes, something that is even used today in post-independence India. Here's a, you know, Mr. Middleton observing about this uh, with survey of Punjab. He basically said, we pigeonholed every one in caste. And if we could not identify a true system, quote, true caste, labeled them one with a name of a hereditary occupation. We deplored the system and the effects, but we are largely responsible for the system we deplore. Government's passion of labels and pigeonholes has crystallized, led to the crystallization of the caste system, which expect, except among the aristocratic castes was really very fluid under indigenous rule. So this I think is a very powerful quote that I use many times to, to talk about people in, in, the, on, you know, in the US and stuff like that about the caste system. So essentially the British essentialized, exoticized and totalized castes across Indian society. And as a result, they exacerbated social discrimination and created this idea of caste consciousness. Now, along with this, while this was happening, one of the things that they had done is they wanted to figure out, okay, how can we, to rule better, what is the one book or the one way or the one uh, sort of like teacher that is uh, you know, very popular amongst the, the community or the Indian society? Because they were coming from a very sort of Victorian and Christian idea of a Pope, a single book, a single law book, et cetera, et cetera and also who's pure, who's not pure, what is civility, et cetera. And then finally, the idea 
of what they call a despotic priest, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, to understand, okay, there must be, you know, coming from a Protestant background where the Protestants rebelled against the church, uh, there had to be an idea of a despotic priest to be spotted somewhere in the Indian subcontinent. But unfortunately, they were mistaken because unlike the Bible or the Quran, uh, there is no single book used by Hindus. There is no Sankara, Shankaracharya that is respected uh, by every single population. There is no priest respected by the entire Indian subcontinent and things like that as a, as a sort of a um, you know, overarching theme. So one of the things that I observed is that what were the real intentions? Of course, their real intentions were codified by Dharampal in, in his um, beautiful tree, where he says, look, they were not centered on the people, but rather their idea was to use ancient texts to make people conform to what they chose from these texts and new interpretations. Then, of course, their other idea was to convert and Christianize those who they considered ready for conversions. So this was a real idea that how can we use a particular book or some kind of a law book that can then be uh, applied across the entire subcontinent. While they started to do this, uh, you know, before that there were certain attempts. Uh, one of them was the Code of Gentoo Laws that was introduced around 18, uh, 1772 or so, uh, but they also found that to be inadequate. So, you know, for uh, for the Hindus used the Dharma Shastras and for the Gentus or I mean for the Muslims used the Quran. While the Muslims had a single book, unfortunately for the Hindus, they found out that the Shastras, there were many of them, and some people followed them, some people did not follow them, and things like that. With all this frustration, it was one guy who was a judge at that time, uh, Sir William Jones, as many of you may know, he decided that he's going to translate the manuscript because he said, I can no longer bear to be at the mercy of our pundits who deal with Hindu law as they please and make it reasonable, make it a reasonable race when they cannot find a ready made. So he said, I'm frustrated with this society. I'm going to go and translate the manuscript. And as we know, he was one of the most powerful figures of that time and had a massive influence of how Hinduism, how Sanskrit, how Indian civilization, how Indian texts, et cetera, were studied. So here's something that when he is, when you look at the, uh, the, the Manuspriti translations, here's a really, I mean, I'm not going to read the whole quote, but here's a really, uh, this thing shines up at what his real intention behind this was. So his idea was that the, you know, the best intended legislative positions would not have any effect on the local population because we are not looking at what the people would believe in. So if we can come up with something that is essentially saying that if the, especially the people, which is the Indian people, universally and sincerely believed that there, it was through their ancient times that these rules were established and they actually had sanction of an actual revelation from heaven, the Britain, the British people will be much successful in administering the Indian society. So in this particular book, the, this, uh, uh, this translation, he actually goes on to talk about this and essentially says, look, if we do this, the local uh, communities, the local population will be much more uh, amenable to our rules and regulations because what we're showing to them is that, hey, look, we're just governing you with what already existed. So you're, we, we, ha we are showing you divine sanction. We're not ruling you by any kind of so-called British authority were ruling you by what was in your Shastras, for example. So that was a really important move uh, as far as uh, William Jones is concerned. Then comes the idea of Brahmanism. So this word has continued to be used in a very pejorative way, but it's a colonial construct, which I also uncovered, and I'll share some thoughts on that. As I mentioned before, the Judeo-Christian enlightened and the post-enlightenment backgrounds had a huge impact on how these scholars study Hinduism and their approach to the, the multifaceted uh, tradition as well as the population that existed. The mind boggling diversity was just incomprehensible for them because the idea that the world was just born, you know, 4004 BCE or, you know, the, the, the superior real, the religions are Christian and Christianity, et cetera, just did not sit well with the sophisticated uh, complex, uh, you know, culture that they had encountered. And of course, with their general disdain for the Hindus with two O's, as I use, um, the idea of a despotic priest and Brahminical tyranny, uh, tyranny was, uh, you know, was sort of like shaped into a powerful idea uh, using Victorian notions of how society should be structured and what the issues of society are. Some of the uh, important figures, and you know, some, some of you may know these figures, some of you may not know these figures, 
but I'll, I'll talk about a few of them. Um, one of them was William Ward, another was James Mill, Monier Monier Williams, and A.L. Basham. There are four players that I'm going to be talking about, there, but there are a whole bunch of them that kind of shaped this very powerful idea that it's this priest, this Brahmin, that was the source of all problems. Uh, Susan Bailey, in her book, actually talks about this. She mentions that someone like Ward, the Christian polemics like Ward's, were clearly a major, if acknowledged, source of later academic theorists, including modern anthropologists, who came to regard the Brahmin as the arbiter and moral, a moral center of the Hindu social order. The idea or the vision of immoral Brahmin despotism clearly drew on proper, prop, popular English Protestant mythology of a priest-ridden, tyrannized papist Europe awaiting liberation by the triumph of a reformation spirit. And that reformation was going to be brought about by the British in the case of India. Here are some thoughts of Mr. Ward. Uh, no morality for how, how should, be a, should a people be moral whose gods are monsters of vice, whose priests, there it is, are the, their ringleaders in crime, whose scriptures encourage pride, impurity, falsehood, revenge, and murder, whose worship is connected with indescribable abominations, and whose heaven is a brothel. This is what he was saying about Indian culture, about Hinduism, things like that. Another guy, James Mill, whose history of British India is one of the like most, um, I would say, Hindu phobic and Indo phobic, as uh, Tom, Thomas Troutman says, uh, works out there. Yeah, he says, in short, despotism and priestcraft taken together, the Hindus in mind and body, the one of the most enslaved portion of the human race. Monier Monier Williams, uh, who has, you know, who was obviously very influential in the way Sanskrit has been you know, with his Sanskrit dictionary. Uh, but he's also credited for popularizing this, uh, this idea and the word Brahmanism in the English language. And one of the things that happened was he actually wrote a book called Brahmanism and Hinduism, where if you look at this, uh, it's a snapshot on the right side. He actually talks about the, phys the, the, the phases of like a, a, the Hindu religion, per se. So he starts with Vedism, which is the purest religion. Uh, then comes Brahmanism, which is priestcraft and all this other stuff. And then comes into Hinduism, which is basically all kinds of superstitions, all garbage that was left over from these two sort of stages of life. And he goes into this stuff. So you will start to see in these chapters, if you ever read this book, Brahmanism and Hinduism, you actually have information that he provides of how this system slowly degraded into what he calls Hinduism. So two quotes from here uh, that I've kind of put in there. It must be understood that the almost infinite divisions of castes and varieties of castes, observance rest on one, on one unvarying substratum of theological dogma of which Brahmins are the keepers and exponents. You can see it's coming out again, Brahmins, right? All the diversities, skeptical beliefs are so as to speak roped to together by one rigid and unyielding li line of Brahminical pantheistic doctrine. So now he's pulling in this whole idea of Brahminical tyranny, Brahminical despotism, all these things together into a, a pantheistic doctrine that only the Brahmins control. Hinduism is Brahminism codified by the creeds and superstitions of Buddhist and non-Aryan races of all kinds, including Dravidians, Kolarians, and perhaps pre-Kolarian aborigines. It has been modified by ideas imported from the religions of later conquering races, such as Islam and Christianity. So you can see that Monier Williams provided a powerful uh, background on how people should think about Brahminism. And by the way, this type of uh, idea and framework is still used in Indology today. A.L. Basham actually focused on a similar thing. He showed a linear progression of Hinduism from basically the Aryan, the so-called Aryan religion into this idea of Brahminism and Hinduism. But for him, again, the Brahmin was a central, uh, you know, sort of, um, I would say, focus or the role played in this particular structuring. And one of the interesting things that he actually uh, was saying is that the idea of, uh, you know, Vedas was very a tribalist. And the sacred rituals were inspired by the drinking. So there was a very focus on the drinking aspect, the Soma drinking aspects where priests would get drunk and have grand visions of, you know, the universe and whatever, whatever. And here are some, um, you know, um, from Ronald Inman's imagining idea. Here are some quotes about Basham. He says the worshippers inebriated with, inebriated with Soma saw wondrous visions of God. They experienced strange sensations of power. They could reach up and touch the heavens. They became immortal. They were gods themselves, the worshippers being the priests. The Brahmin was more powerful than any earthly king or god. But by his accurate performance, he maintained all things. and was therefore the supreme social servant, so on and so forth. 
Now, one another aspect of this was the criminal tribes and martial races. If you look at the draconian policies that were in, implemented by the Criminal Tribes Act, which lasted from 1871 to 1920, entire jatis and tribes and groups were guilty, essentially, were assigned uh, guilt by birth, arrested, separated, quarantined in different penal colonies. And but the biggest targets were the so-called lower caste nomads and forest dwelling groups, including eunuchs and homosexuals. They did not conform to this idea of order, control, Victorian uh, concepts and things like that. So the implementation of this policy had a, had a very uh, disastrous effect on Indian society at that time. To show the, some of the racisms around this, you can see that uh, one of the folks said, when we speak of professional criminals, we, we meaning a tribe of ancestors whose criminals from time to time immemorial were themselves destined by the uses of caste to commit crime and whose descendants will be offenders against law until the whole tribe is exterminated or accounted for in the manner of thugs. The policy implementation impacted roughly 13 million people, but there have been studies to show that over 100 million people in India live under the shadow of this, this criminal tribes act. Even today, so, the stigmatism, the stigmatism essentially uh, does not go away even uh, today. Uh, in uh, religious uh, and uh, just to kind of show you that uh, a table of the Criminal Tribes Act, uh, this information is available online, so you can take it, take a look at it. Different types of tribes that were called criminals and how they were, their habits were criminals, uh, uh, criminalized, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something that is uh, that continues to have an impact even today on uh, Indian society. Uh, when I say Indian society, it's basically a quote unquote South Asia. Another idea was this idea of race theories that certain races were uh, superior than others uh, based on the British mapping of the Aryan Dravidian concepts. So certain uh, aspects of Rajput, Sikhs, Gurkhas, Dogras, even Muslims were heavily favored and recruited versus Tamilians and Bengalis. And at certain points, uh, the entire Tamil uh, Tamilian population and Bengali population started to disappear from the, the Indian army. And because they were considered less manly, because they were less, again, uh, you know, they were not as Aryan as the other folks were. This became even worse when the 1857 Sepoy mutiny happened. And today what we see is a dominant prevalence of some of these other regiments, for example, in the Indian army, which is a vestige of the colonial uh, policies. So here's General George McMahon. He's talking about the martial races. He basically says, well, the martial races were largely the product of the original white Ar Aryan race. The white invaders in the days of the early supremacy started the caste system as a protection, it is believed, against the devastating effects on morals and ethics of miscegenation with Dravidian and Aboriginal people. So you can see, start to see how this had an effect, because if you had a job in the army, many Jatis would benefit from that. So they decided there, there was this entire idea that people started to compete for becoming a more superior or more martial race and caste, quote unquote. And as a result, this forced a very interesting uh, you know, dynamic within the subcontinent. There was a lot of uh, initial pushback, both from the administrators and also from the local population. But initially, that was there. But after that, there was acceptance of Jatis vying for different types of uh, you know, like power structures. Uh, they pitted groups against each other. And uh, because they shared very similar characteristics, which ones can be better? Uh, so they started to like basically fight for privilege in this new power structure and dynamic. And, and all of these different concepts, Indian local concepts of Sampradaya, Kula, Gotra, Jati, Shreni, were then reduced to this one idea of caste. And that's something that we unfortunately see even today as far as the Western narratives are concerned. And uh, you know, I won't read the Dirk's uh, quote, but he basically was talking about how upper caste notions of this respectability and religious scruple became increasingly anglicized. And the different different you know jatis and, and quote unquote castes were incited by different conventions, and they wanted to prove themselves basically more uh, Brahminic, more Brahminical, more Sanskritized, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what has happened is that a whole lot of scholars today have shown that the colonial experiments, a growing body of these scholars, have shown that the colonial experiments, along with the Mughals, uh, are uh, you know have resulted in what we see uh, as a system today. So I'll just share a few. Uh, uh, I would say scholars that have actually focused on this. So Nicholas Dirks has, a, in his cast of mind, a seminal book on this, pointed out that the caste system was largely, uh, the, the way we see it today, a result of the British colonial rule. 
he, he talks about, it is increasingly clear that colonials have produced new forms of society that have been taken to be traditional. And that caste, as we know it, is not a residual survival, but a specifically colonial form of civil society. Eaton and Ronald Inden both pointed out that the caste system as we know today, or as it started to happen, resembled its modern forms only since the 1200 to 1500 period. Central was to this was a fall of the Hindu kingship followed by the Turkish invasions. Bailey observes that from 1650 to 1850, this idea of priestly hierarchy, which we talked about earlier, kingship and ascetic renunciation became much, much more important in Indian society and were developed further due to the Mughals. And the idea of stratification and familiarization of this system was uh, introduced in Mughals uh, through their interactions with Rajputs, but also assignments of who's high and who's low in terms of birth and stuff. As she says, by the early 18th century, a whole range of standardized social classifications had become central to the language of officials, scholars, and military men. And finally, uh, Dr. Prakash Shah and the team have done a great job in bringing up similar conclusions in their, in their similar work on Western foundations of the caste system. There are a numerous scholars. We have collected lots and lots of articles and research papers, et cetera, on this idea. So a growing body of scholars and researchers have shown that today's caste system, as we know, is mostly a result of British colonial experiments, along with uh, the stratification that was implemented by the Mughals. So in conclusion, the British policies around census governance and economics, combined with their idea of race and religion uh, around what they saw as native non-Christian populations and cultures, completely froze the fluid system, the Jati Varna system, in the heterogeneous Indian society as we knew it. However, what's going on is a large body of scholarships has been sh shedding a lot of lights on this false narrative that you know caste was 3,000 years old, thousands and thousands of years old, and it's never changed, and this is a fault of Hinduism and things like that. These scholars are now challenging this dynamic and essentially pushing back against outdated racist theories, racist theories of caste. And I would say we need to promote as collectively as society, as people, as scholars, we need to promote and build upon this research further and further. Thank you very much and namaste. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and also you were able to keep your time also so exactly well. Uh, I forgot to introduce uh, Sri Nikunj. Uh, Nikunj Trivedi is the president and co-founder of Pona, C-O-H-N-A, a grassroots advocacy and civil rights organization dedicated to improving the understanding of Hinduism in North America and working on matters impacting the Hindu community. He has been involved in education, advocacy and civil rights for over two decades and uh, speaks frequently on various national and international forums as well as media outlets. He is a former chairman and president of Hindu Students Council, one of the largest Hindu student organizations in North America, and also serves on its board of trustees. He works in the financial services industry in New York and lives with his uh, uh, family in New Jersey. Thank you very much, Sri Nukinji. There are many uh, accolades coming from the panelists and audience to your marshalling of evidence after evidence in such a wonderful way. Thank you very much. If there are questions, we'll take them up towards the end of the whole program.